that speaker has looked at the rock. He was a postdoc at uh, Sandia Labs in Livermore. Uh, no, where's the Sandia Labs in Livermore? Um, she obtained her PhD from the University of Louisville. She's been talking about coronal loop detection from solar images. Good afternoon. Uh, today I'm going to talk about coronal loop detection. Uh, we went to astronomy and astrophysics fields again. Um, uh, first, I want to describe what is coronal loop. Uh, I think it's not very visible from, from the faces, uh, but uh, here there is one loop and there is other parts too. Uh, and coronal Coronal loops appear on the solar surface, and uh, uh, they are the immense arches of hot gas. And uh, they, are really, uh, they are related to other events like coronal, coronal leaking problems, solar plate triggering, and abrupt temperature changes. And astrophysicists analyze these uh, coronal loops to understand their features and uh, understand the relations between the other solar events. Um, In order to uh, make scientific analysis, they are analyzing SOHO EIT images. And uh, SOHO uh, has been taking pictures uh, of, of the sun since 1995. And uh, it takes six pictures per day, mostly. And uh, they are, it is taking the pictures in different ultraviolet violet wavelengths. Uh, we are doing our analysis with the 171 angstrom images. Um, and uh, currently <coughs> astrophysicists are looking at every image separately and if they find interesting uh, coronal loops, they are just marking that region on the image and they are putting that image into their interesting <coughs> data sets. And uh, it is very time consuming and it is subject to human errors. Uh, in our study, we want to automatize this detection phase uh, here. So is taking images of the sun and uh, NASA is uh, storing those images in so called EIT uh, catalog and uh, we are getting those catalogs then we are learning features and we learning coronal loops then uh, delivering sub just subset of solar images with coronal loops to the researchers. Um, I want to show two samples with coronal loop and uh, with, with coronal loop and without coronal loop. And in this study we are interested in the coronal loop's outer surface, not inside the disk, so just not outside the disk. Um, and it is not very visible, but there is some loop shape here. Uh, and in the other one there is no coronal loops. And, uh, but there are some other activities that you can see. So we have to distinguish those activities from coronal loops. Uh, we we uh, have lots of challenges in this project. Uh, first thing, all the coronal loops are in different shape, in different sizes, and their density is changing. For example, here, uh, density is very high here, but it is losing intensity in this part, and we are using lots of data. Uh, when we apply image cleaning techniques, uh, we are, for example, in the last one, nothing is left after, after image cleaning. And uh, coronal loops are not the only events, so there are other solar events, and uh, those events share some characteristics with Coronal, coronal loops. So we have to learn coronal loops, but we have to learn other events, and we have to make distinction between those events. Um, another challenge is uh, coronal loops are embedded in bright regions, and we have to bring out those coronal loops from those regions. Um, and as I said before, densities are changing. In the top parts, density is very low, so when, I, when we apply uh, 
image cleaning, we are losing information from top, and every information is important for uh, researchers. And uh, there is time dimension of this data. Uh, it has uh, uh, solar. Uh, uh, there are sol solar cycles, and uh, there is two main. There are two main solar cycles: solar maxima and solar minima. And in solar maxima, there are so many coronal loops, but there are so many other events too. Uh, here, uh, in 2001, it is the highest. Uh, it is the solar maxima, and currently in 2012, we are also in solar maxima. So there are so many events occurring in in the sun, and in the solar minima, there are not many events. Uh, so if we train our system based on solar maxima, we will miss uh, the images without loops. We have to learn from those uh, those images without loops too. Uh, I want to show one example here. This is the uh, quartz sun. There are not many activities, and the other one is uh, from 2002. This from solar maxima. We can see many events. <coughs> uh, to solve the problem, uh, this is a direct line physical pattern recognition problem. First, experts are uh, marking the images with coronal loops, and they are they are locating those regions. Uh, after that, we are preparing images. Uh, we apply several image cleaning techniques in this phase, and uh, we are we are extracting blo blocks around the sun, around the solar disk, and we label those loops, uh, those blocks as loop or non-loop. Then, from those two categories, we extract features and we train uh, uh, we, we train several classifiers, then we, we get classifier models at the end. Uh, here, uh, th those yellow boxes are the export markings, and the other red ones are non regions. So we have to distinguish those two types. And uh, maybe you can see here there is, there is no like arch shape or anything, it's just a cloud. Um, first, first thing, the image was very problematic, and first uh, uh, we are applying some uh, RDA software uh, to remove some instrument defects. Uh, maybe you can see some grids in the image. We are getting rid of those grids, and there are also some noise. We also get rid of those noise with RDA solar software. After that, we apply uh, the speckling and smoothing uh, to remove specks. And we apply a wavelet transform to get smooth, much smoother image. Uh, then, uh, in the last phase, we do background subtraction to bring out coronal loops from the brighter regions. Then, uh, we are working with those final images. See, the coronal loops are clear. Uh, after that, as I said before, we are applying, we are extracting blocks. Uh, around the solar disk. Um, here you can see the blocks over there. Uh, and there are some positive uh, classes and negative classes. Uh, um, uh, first, we have some grade level images, and those grade level images are important for us, but we also want to get contours, uh, just the skeleton of those fluxes. Uh, so we apply some scale latent technique we implemented. Um, and here you can see we got the uh, we got the uh, scale latent very well and uh, the other like morphological technique uh, was not very really successful. It ended up changing the shape so it's damaged. Um, and uh, after that, we have to receive each contour separately. Here, there are so many contours, and this is, there is one loop contour here, and there are two, two non loop uh, contours, and there is another loop contour there. So we have to get all the contours done, classify those contours as like loop and non loop. Um, 
here uh, we have lots of problems. Uh, as I said before, the top parts are missing, so this part is missing. The color line going to connect this part with this part. Human uh, uh, are uh, we can we can merge those two separate contours and we can make one group, but it is very hard for uh, for automatic automated systems. Uh, so I developed one uh, salient contour group extraction method, and here I am using some perceptual rules, uh, and I am using Pankovian random micro random fields here. Mm, I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, after that, we have gray level blocks and the uh, binary blocks, uh, and from each one we are extracting features. Uh, we are extracting statistical features like brightness contrast uh, and we are like uh, histogram of oriented gradients, directional variables, eigenvalue histograms and curvature histograms. And from binary uh, version we are getting half-based features like ellipse, we are fitting ellipse to the contours or we are fitting line on the contours. Uh, also like we are using um, arc, arc to chord features. Uh, then we train several classifiers, uh, AdaBoost, Naive Decision Trees, um, K-Nearest Neighbor, Multilayer, multi Perceptron. Uh, and uh, uh, in the first phase, uh, we were not receiving very good results. Uh, the, the highest result was like 67%. And uh, uh, since the date time is important, we had to select the uh, very carefully. We didn't have lots of export markings, so we selected 30 images from each, uh, like 1996, 1997, their solar minima years, and 2000 and 2001 solar maxima, um, and 2004 and 2005 is like medium, not like minima, not like maxima. And uh, we received 400 book blocks and almost 8,000 non book blocks. So there is in the last data problem that it is like 1 to 20. And uh, these are the results of time called cross validation. Um, uh, for us, both precision and recall were important. So they should be, uh, they should both high. And AWS with, uh, uh, with a decision tree gave the uh, highest result for us. Um, since we didn't have lots of Lots of positive instances. We uh, we decided to do incremental learning. Uh, so we had some images. We downloaded images. Uh, then we applied the classifier model we obtained in the previous phase. Uh, then based on those uh, classifier model results, we trained the data again. Here there are two types of uh, results. Uh, one of them is like positive results with high confidence. So we trust them and we put them into training data automatically. But there are other types they are like with low confidence. Uh, so classifiers uh, didn't agree on, on those instances. Uh, in those ones, we showed them to experts. So experts gave feedback on those. Then we put them on the training data again. Uh, uh, with that phase, uh, we improved, uh, we increased the number of loop blocks to twice almost, and non-loop blocks, we didn't add too much, just the uh, critical, critical non-loop blocks to in, in, increase the diversity in the training data. And uh, with that, we increased the training and test, uh, we, we increased the training results. Um, but we were very conservative, we didn't want to uh, add bad uh, like improve the precision but decrease the recall so they should be both good. Um, and based on those classifier models, uh, we implemented solar loop mining tool and this tool, uh, astrophysicists enter a uh, set of images, then R2 uh, separates them into two groups, like groups with loops and groups without loops. Um, and generally it takes three seconds per image, uh, all the image uh, preparation and the training, uh, and we also tested this tool. Uh, we we had hundred images uh, from different years, 
uh, and uh, 50 of them had loops and 50 of them didn't have loops and uh, we were able to discriminate these images uh, with high, high confidence, high precision and recall. Um, here we, we also developed a web-based image query tool and in this tool researchers are just uploading the images then uh, they can query uh, on the database. Uh, I just I just uh, presented one portion, first phase of the uh, R study, and um, it was a new problem, new pattern recognition problem, and uh, we had to deal with like imbalanced data or uh, limited training data, uh, and uh, we were some experts were giving training data for us, but there were like a couple of students, PhD students, and everybody has uh, marking different region, so there was no consensus between them, and that decreased our classification results. Uh, um, also, we had dynamic nature of the data. Uh, let's say we trained the data with uh, certain years, but if we give 2012 images, what's going to happen? Uh, so we wanted to provide diverse uh, training data to improve the uh, confidence of our system. Um, and uh, I would like to thank John Chimas from the University of Memphis and uh, some like Marcus Eshvanen from Lucky Martin. They gave uh, good comments to us. <coughs>